Good morning. How you guys doing today? Awesome. You're my second service people. You're my awake people, right? Yes. All the way from the back. I like it. All right. Hey, uh, so if we've never met, my name's TJ. I'm the pastor here at the Shore Church. And you just saw um, we have a new series starting next week called At the movies. It's one of our favorite series every year. Um, it's, it's, it's really exciting. We do a little bit of uh, clips from different movies, and then we use that as a message uh, for the day, and, and we preach, and we go to clips and back and forth. And then we have popcorn and Coke for your kids and you, but mostly your kids because they love it, right? So, oh, some of you guys, I love uh, preaching at the movies. is fun because I watch everybody doing this the whole time. It's... <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So that starts next week. I encourage you uh, to be here, not to miss it, and uh, it, it'll be a really great series for us. Um, here at the shore, we believe that God has a greater life for you. Like where you are is fine, but it's not the, it, it, there's something greater in God for you. I believe that. Do you believe that? So we as a church believe that. And so it starts, though, with having a, a relationship, like really knowing God. That's where it starts. And then we get to find freedom in him uh, from the things in our past that have held us back. And then we get to discover our real true purpose in him. And then after that, we even get to make a difference in the world around us. And when we're doing that, I believe we're actually impacting the world. We're living the greater life that God has designed for us, okay? So it's, it's an incredible thing that God has for us. And throughout our series, our goal is to see how God can bring a greater life to us. Because I know that there's greater life out there. How does this series do that? Well, we do it through studying God's word and encountering him. Because he's the only one that can do that in our lives, right? So today, we're going to be in week number four of our series called Galatians, and Galatians is a book of the Bible, but it didn't start as a book. It actually started as a letter written by a man named Paul to a church in the region of Galatia. Galatia is in what is now modern-day Turkey, and Paul came through that area, started a church, and moved on to go start more churches. And he would write letters back to the churches he had already started, giving them coaching and encouragement and other things. But the book of Galatians is a little different than some of these other letters because he just basically says to the Galatian church, here's what you're doing, stop it. That's it. Like he's like, you're doing it wrong. You need to stop it. And so we've been learning from what they did wrong and how we can kind of improve. And, and here's, what, here's what happened. After he started this church, a group of people came in called the Judaizers. They left Jerusalem, and they came to these new Christians, these Gentile believers in Galatia, and they said, hey, you've accepted Jesus, and, and, and you're a Christian now, but here's the other things that you have to do to be a real Christian. You guys ever have that kind of conversation in your own mind or your own head? And so they said, you need to obey all of the Jewish law as well as believing in Jesus. And so Paul writes the letter. He goes, no. No, 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 no. Jesus was enough by himself. You don't need to do all the other things. And in this, we kind of get to see the two brands or the two forms or the two types of Christianity. And these two types aren't divided by country, region. They're not divided by denomination or church because any one of us could be either one of these brands right here in this room. It's an individual thing. And the two brands are this. One says if you could do all the actions well, and get all the actions right, one day you would measure up and you would become a good person. And that good person is pleasing to God, so God will like you and let you into his perfect heaven. Or there's Jesus, who already did it all, who already paid it all, and offers it to you, and it's called grace. And the only thing you have to do is receive. Does that make you guys see the difference between these two? On this side, you try to earn it, but the problem is, you can't earn it. On this side, you try to get good enough, but the problem is, we could never be good enough. Does that make sense? And so we have this side where it's, Jesus has already done it, or we try to discipline ourselves and do all the right things to earn it. And that's a problem, isn't it? Now, throughout this series, we've talked about these two differences and what's been going on. I want to add two more ways to describe it. I'm going to give you two words for these two sides, whether it's the grace of Jesus or our own, our own efforts and our own work. I'm going to give you two different words, but I have to set it up like this. The first thing I'm going to do is Galatians 3.26. I'm going to read you that, and then we'll go into chapter 4, okay? Chapter 3 says this, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God when you have this salvation experience, this faith in Jesus. Now, Ladies, this is not like a male-only kind of a club, okay? 
Just because it says son doesn't mean it doesn't mean all people. It was just a general way of saying, hey, it's for y'all, okay? And so I'm sorry, ladies, today I'm going to call you sons. Is that okay? I got one okay. Okay, so Jesus calls, calls all of the church the bride of Christ. So Jesus calls me a bride, so I think it's okay to call you a son. Is that cool? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, oh, that's funny. Okay, good. All right. So today when I say the word son, I mean all of people. Sons and daughters, children, however, whatever you want to put it in your head, it means people, okay? The, the people that have believed, have followed God with their whole life. And so with that in mind, let's go to chapter 4 and continue what Paul's writing. But when the set time had finally fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what did Paul just say? He said, at the right time, Jesus came and he was born. And he lived under the law. He lived the, the laws that these Judaizers were trying to get these new Christians to follow. But he followed them perfectly, never broke one, was sinless and spotless in his life. And laid down his life so that you could become a child of God. You guys see that? The spirit of adoption came upon you. And that, that, uh, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Look, look at this. You didn't do anything, but God said, I am going to send the spirit of adoption and put it in them. I'm, I'm going to adopt them into my family, not because they asked me, but because I love them. Not because they're good enough, because, but because I want them, right? Like, like when they placed their faith in my son Jesus, I said, you know what? I'm going to make you a son as well. I'm going to make you a daughter as well, and I'm going to enter you into my family. We are children of God. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. And so he goes on. Um, and, and because you're his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now this would have been a revolutionary sort of terminology uh, for these people reading this. Whether they had a Jewish background or a Gentile background, they never thought of God as an Abba, Father. And here's what the word Abba means. It means, well, let, let me say it like this. We have multiple words. So there's Father. There's dad, and then there's daddy, right? So he's saying, Abba, father, it's, it's not the more formal father. It's actually like saying daddy. I walked into a, a restaurant the other day to meet my kids and my wife for lunch uh, one day, and, and this, this couple weeks ago, and they had all gotten done with VBS, and I was meeting them there, uh, vacation Bible school, for those of you who don't know what that is, just like a little mini camp, day camp for the kids. Okay, so, and they learned about Jesus. So they got done. My wife picked them up. I met them for lunch. And I was across the restaurant. They were in the far corner, kind of all lined up on their little area. And I walked in and they saw me and they went, Daddy! In unison, all of them at the same time. And the entire restaurant turned and looked at me and was like, that's their daddy right there. He said, that's the guy. I see it. Like the whole place looked at me. But the reason why they use that language is because there's an intimate relationship between me and my kids. And Paul says, when you refer to God, I want you to use the intimate language, not the other kind. And that would have been mind-blowing for them. Because in the Jewish world, it was the laws, the rules pleased God. And if you followed the rules and the laws, you pleased the God who wasn't here. He was watching you. And he was waiting for you to mess up, right? And if you listen, the, the people in Galatia were Gentile people, and their religious practices were influenced by the Greeks and the Romans. You guys, have you ever studied Greek and Roman gods? Yeah, no, I don't, they're not very nice people, right? Like, or very nice gods, whatever it is. They're just, there's a lot of drama going on in that place, right? And, and so they would think of God as this distant, flawed sort of being, right? Whatever it is, whether he's angry and distant, whether he's flawed and distant, whatever it was, there was a distance between you and God. And so the, the, this group of people came in and said, hey, you need to change the way you live. You need to look at God differently. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. Here's how you look at God. With intimacy. You call him Abba, Father. Not because uh, you did anything right, but because he said, I'm going to make you my child. I love you that much. I want you in my family. So now you can call me dad. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So there's two words in here that I want to use for you to kind of describe these two areas. One is slave and one is son. Slave and son. 
And we're going to talk about the differences between being a slave and being a son. He says, you're no longer a slave, but you're a son. Well, what does that even look like? What does that feel like? How do we know if we're living as a slave or living as a son? Well, I'm going to give you some differences, okay? The first one is this. A slave has a master. A master. You, what's the relationship between a slave and a master? It's, it's not a healthy one, is it? It's, it's okay, don't, I just want to get out of your way. I don't want to make you angry. I, I just, there's some groveling involved, maybe some begging involved, right? Like, like many of us pre- treat God in that same way. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Could you just forgive me this last time? I promise I'll never do it again. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I, I'll, I'll, can you change this? Or please don't be angry with me, right? We, we treat God like that. But it's different because with a son, because a son has a father. A son has a, like a real father. I, I look at the life of Jesus, and, and I got to think that Jesus is a pretty awesome guy, right? Because these, at one point, the disciples had to pull the kids off of Jesus because they were wanting to be on Jesus. Now, if you think about that for a minute, and you look at all of the paintings and descriptions of Jesus that we have today, Jesus is always like looking up into heaven like, and his hand's doing one of these. And there's like a heart with a flame on it right over here. I don't know a single kid that's like, can you pick me up? And when you're, you, yeah, they're not doing that. He, he, cause I think Jesus was like pretty fun. I think Jesus was fun to be around. Because kids were piling, kids don't pile on somber, stoic, malnourished looking people. Right? They, they, they go to the fun guy, right? I think Jesus had lollipops in his robe somewhere. It's like, here you go. Here, let's get that one out. He's like, <laughs> pull my finger, right? Like, he just he did the, he, these things. Jesus was fun. He was a father. And when I envision my heavenly father, I want to be like a child that's just climbing into the lap of his dad. Like, like when my three-year-old climbs up and he goes, Dad, can we go fishing or something? Yes, we can go fishing or something, man. Let's, will you play with me? Yes, I'll play with you. Like, that's the kind of relationship Paul's saying, call your dad, your Abba Father. Like, real relationship. Romans chapter 8 kind of repeats it again. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves. God did not give you a spirit to make you a slave so that you live in fear again. You used to live in fear. We're not going to go there again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, there's that word again. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Like there's there's something going on inside of us. That the Spirit of God comes inside of us, and then the Spirit inside of you is going, yes, this is your Father. Yes, this is healthy. Yes, this is good. Yes, this is what we need to do. You need to treat him as a Father. And that's what I want to do. That's the way I want to live my life. But have you ever found yourself kind of slipping back in the old way of things? Oh, man, I messed up. God's probably so ticked at me right now. Right? But that's not how he is. He said, no, come to me. I want to receive you. A, a second difference is this. A slave is an employee. You ever, you ever uh, been to a restaurant and that employee just doesn't care? You, you, ever, you ever walk in and that front desk person, they're like, what you want? Right? Like, they just don't even care. Like, they're like, I just work here kind of people. Or the customer service on the phone, oh my gosh, right? They, they could be rude, they could be whatever, and it's just like, ugh. So like, they just work here. They're just a person. They're, they, they're, they're just going through the motions. Some of us, we're like, ah, oh, you know, I gotta read my Bible because I kinda have to, right? Oh, I gotta go to church because this is what I'm supposed to be doing, right? And so that's kind of the attitude. We just, ah, I just work here. <laughs> just at the church, I just work here. You know, whatever. But, a son, a son is an heir. Like, like they're, they're owning this thing. You ever, you ever go to a restaurant and you meet the owner? That's a little different then, isn't it? You go to the business and the owner's taking care of you? You know it's going to be right if the owner's taking care of you because the owner's like, that's my name on there, right? And when we become children of God, we are adopted into the family business. Come on, somebody. Like, the kingdom of God, that's you. That's yours. The business of God, reaching people, loving people, caring for people, serving others. God just said, come on in. This is your business. And, that, and I love it. This place is yours. Like this church, not this building. The church isn't a building. The church is the people, right? 
this is, it kind of, it always kind of makes me laugh when I'm out in the lobby and, and someone goes, Pastor, I just love your church. And I'm like, well, it ain't my church. No, 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 no. This is our church, right? Because we are God's children. We own this sucker. Right? Like, like, like let, let's read this verse, Romans chapter 8. It says this, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. God looks at his son Jesus and goes, man, I love you so much. And then he looks at you beside him and says, I've adopted you just like him. I love you so much. So this church, this, this kingdom of God work, you can't just go, oh man, well, the pastor's got that one. No, no, this isn't my kingdom. This is our kingdom, right? Like, like that piece of paper floating through the parking lot. Man, the church got paper in the parking lot. No, we, our church, you, me, and we all got church. We got that, that, that paper in the parking lot. You know what I'm saying? Look like the, nobody put some pens in the chair in front of you. The people in first service done stole them all, right? Like, oh my gosh, there's no pens here. Well, well, this church has a problem. They got no pens. No, you got a problem. This is your church. Those are your pens. Go get you some pens. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh my gosh, there's a person here for the first time in the hospitality team. Didn't say hello to them. Ugh, oh my gosh. They got a problem. They ain't got a problem. You got a problem. Does that make sense? This, you, you have a guest in your house. What you're going to do? You don't, you don't, people don't come in your house, sit down, and you ignore them. But how many times have you had that happen at church? Okay, now I got real quiet in here. We, we, we're, this, is, this is our family, air, joint, kingdom, effort. If there were teams, we're on God's team. He's putting you in the game. Go out there and do it. Does that make sense? We're not a slave. There's work here. No. This is our place. We're the owners. This is what we do. This is how we live our life. Does that make sense to you guys? Good. Okay. Now, the next comparison I'm going to do um, takes a little bit of setting up. So last week I talked about grace, uh, the grace of God. And so we can either try to earn our way into doing right enough to try to get close to God, or Jesus already gave us his grace that we receive through faith. And so the grace covers anything we've done. And, and, and the temptation in our mind is to say, well, if gr grace of God covers everything, then I can just have the grace of God and keep doing the same old things. Like that's the, because God, God can cover all that, so it's okay. Is it okay? No, it's not okay. And, and here, here, here's why. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, uh, Paul writes to a different church, the Philippian church, or the church in Philippi, and he says this. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. So we don't work hard to get salvation. We work hard to show the results of our salvation. So, so where do you work hard? Before salvation or after? After. So many times that we believe the lie. If I, were good, if I could get my act together, then I could go to church, and then they would accept me, and then I could get to God. But I'm not good enough, so I can't. But it's so opposite of that. God, God accepts you and loves you right where you are. And now the work begins to start to live out this new life that God has given you. Don't work hard for salvation, work hard from salvation. And obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God, he's working in you and giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Before, we, we tried to please him, but our desires got distracted by earthly things. We, we tried to do it in our own strength, but we didn't have the power to do the right things all the time. But then we got grace, the grace of God, and now the power of God and the desire from God is allowing us to do all the things we wanted to do before. Well, I really, God, I wish I could just really get into your word, and I wish I could spend time in prayer, and it's just, I just can't get it, da 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 da, da. But then when you see the grace of God, and God is working in you, that stuff, he gives you the desire for it, and he gives you the power for it. You couldn't do it on your own, but now that you have the grace of God, you're in the family of God, you are a son or a daughter, God goes, now we got it. Now you have the power to do what pleases him. Before you didn't, but now you do. So with that in mind, I want you to give the next comparison. Uh, a slave is driven by duty. You ever feel like you have to? Instead of, I want to, it's like, no, I have to. Like, okay, God, I'm going to do my time today. 
I'm going to read three whole chapters in the Bible. God, I'm going to do my time. I'm going to do my duty as a Christian. I'm going to spend 30 minutes in prayer. 17 minutes in, and you're like, oh my gosh, I've repeated everything twice already. I don't even know what to pray for, right? And you're doing your duty, and you're kind of grumbling. You're oh, I probably should serve in church. All the good Christians are doing it. Now. I'm going to try and be a good Christian. The best people I know are in the kids' ministry, so I got to go there. They're the holiest people. I got to go. I got to go prove that I'm holy just like them. So you go, and you're doing it out of duty, out of duty, out of duty, right? Is that very life giving? Is that very fulfilling? Is that living a greater life? No. But it's different when you're a son because a son is driven by devotion. It's, it's, it's totally different. There's no I have to, there's an I get to. Like when I'm reading God's word, it doesn't matter if I read three chapters or three verses or one verse, whatever. If I'm encountering God, my father, that was good. It's not about how much, it's about who. Does that make sense? How, how about prayer? Oh, I gotta do my hour, I gotta do my 30 minutes, I gotta make sure, no, no, no. Who cares about how long it was? Did you talk to your father today? Do you have relationship with him? When we're serving, oh, I probably should have to. I gotta do that because I'm a Christian and they say I have to because Christians do that stuff. No, no, no. My father is trying to change the world. My father is helping people healing people, embracing people, and I get to be on the same team as him. I get to welcome people into God's house. I get to teach the next generation of kids about a loving father who wants to journey with them, get to invite them into the kingdom. I get to lead people in worship. I get to fill in the blank. I get to because I'm on the God's team. This is his kingdom, and I'm his son. Does that make sense? There's a difference there, isn't there? Totally different. There's a great example of this in Luke chapter 10. Uh, check it out. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that needed to be made. Now, if you look at this chunk of scripture, both Martha and Mary are trying to please Jesus. They're trying to get close to him. They're trying to honor him. But they're doing it in two different ways. You guys see that? Martha kind of got some duty going on, right? Well, I got to do the right thing. I got to work hard. I got to prepare. I got to clean. I got to cook. I got to whatever. And Mary's like, if I could just be in the presence of Jesus, I could show him how much I love him and I care for him, right? And the passage goes on. She came to him, this is Martha, and asked, Lord, Jesus, don't you even care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Don't you care that she's not serving on a Sunday morning? Don't you care that she isn't given anything? Don't you care, right? Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? Tell her to help me. She's trying to serve Jesus, and then she starts bossing Jesus around. Something's messed up when you start bossing Jesus around, right? J telling Jesus what to do. And so he, he comes back, Martha, <laughs> Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, apparently, right? Like, so many things. But few things are needed, and indeed, there's only one thing that's actually needed, and Mary has chosen what is better. I love the language. She chose the better thing, which leads me to believe that when it comes to duty or devotion, it's not something that you get swept up in, it's something that you get to choose. It's not predetermined. It's within your power to change the perspective and the motivation by which you love God, by which you serve him. Martha chose one way, Mary chose another, and Jesus said, do what Mary's doing. Sit at his feet, have relationship with him. Does that make sense to you guys? So. So the question now is, well, how do I become that son? How do I really get that identity as a son or a daughter, as a child of the king? How do I do that? Well, Paul continues in the book of Galatians, and he sets it up like this in chapter 4. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. He's talking about the old way of life. Now, in this context of these Gentile people, it was the Greek and Roman gods. He goes, you were slaves to them, and they weren't even real. They, they, weren't, they weren't real gods. 
But in your life, I'm sure there's something in your past that has enslaved you that wasn't a real God, that wasn't a, a, a God that built you up, that led you to that greater life, right? Maybe it was a pain in your past and that thing kept you enslaved. Maybe there was unforgiveness or bitterness or shame or low self-worth. Maybe it was an addiction or a situation. What, what was it that kept you enslaved, right? It's not a God. Those things kept tried to keep us enslaved, but it's not a God. And so Paul says, they're not even gods. But now what? But now that you know God, so you didn't know God, now you know God, or rather you are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles? How is it that you're trying to get back into slavery even after you left? Nobody in their right mind leaves slavery and goes, you know what, I'll volunteer for another tour. It doesn't happen. But in our spirits, we go back. We, we, we get the grace of God, yet we somehow manage to go, God doesn't really like me that much. It can't, it's too good to be true. And so we go back and say, but if I could really get my life together, then he would be pleased with me. And it's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Why are you going to go back? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Do you want to go back to the slavery of that pain in your life? Do you want to go back to the slavery of that addiction? No. So Paul's like, what, what, you need to see yourself as a son. You need to see yourself as a daughter. I was talking to a friend of mine this week, and we were talking about this, that there is this uh, need in my life for me to kind of crucify the flesh, to get rid of the bad things, to be disciplined, and, and really have that like disciplined life. Uh, but there's also this need in, in us to be a, a son or a daughter and to see our identity from him. And, and I have been, throughout my life, it's way harder for me to see myself as a son or a daughter of God than it is for me to go, okay, I need to get rid of this junk in my life. Like, I'm, I'm way better at, at dealing with the junk, right? I'm way, deal, I'm way better at, like, nailing my pride to the cross and getting rid of that kind of stuff. But seeing myself as a son is not nearly as easy. I don't know about you guys. Some of you guys are like, man, I'm awesome. I cannot get rid of this junk, right? I'm trying to get rid of the junk. I don't think I'm that awesome, right? Like, it's just, everybody has their own thing. And, and, and I was talking to my friend, and he said, could it be that, that you don't need to do this yet, but when you see yourself as a son of God, you get to do these things afterwards? That when you see yourself as a son of God, you can actually walk this out a lot better? See, I think that's what God has for all of us today. So what I want to talk about now is just, becoming that son of God, becoming that child of God. And here's how we do it. Number one, first thing we do is we need to see God as a father. See God as a father. And I know in our Christian language and in our history, we call God father all the time. We have the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But something happens with that word father based on our history. See, if you grew up in a house with a great dad and he did good things and and you hear the word father, you take that definition of father that you have and you put it on God. And you go, hey, God's pretty good. But some of us didn't have that experience, did we? You had, you had a father that was distant, maybe he left. And you take that, that, that definition of father and you put it on God and you go, man, God's kind of far away. He's kind of distant. He, he probably, he has kind of left me. Or maybe dad was there, but he was kind of angry. Maybe he, he just busted you all the time for all the things you did wrong. And you, you take that definition and you put it on God and you say, yeah, God's a father that is just waiting to bust me when I do things wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah, my, my father is near physically, but emotionally he's far away. Yeah, God is here and he probably likes other people, but I can't really connect with him. You guys, you guys hear what I'm talking about? We take an earthly definition and we put it on God. But Jesus tells us that's not even close. In the book of Matthew, uh, he's talking to a group of uh, Jewish people, and they're, he's talking to them about what a father is like. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to good give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So, so Jesus is trying to expand their definition of father. You're saying, you're a father and you do good things to your kids. Imagine how great a great father in heaven would give to you. 
You're, you're, you're a good father and you do good things for your children. Imagine as a child of God what God is willing to do for you. Does that make sense? See, we need to see God not as our earthly fathers, but we need to change our definition and see him as a heavenly father, as an Abba father. Does that make sense? Okay. Number two, second thing, we need to approach God through relationship, not rules. Christians are really good at rules. We make up rules for everything. What you can do, what you can't do, what you can eat and you can't eat and wear and watch. And I mean, just, we got all these rules. But I got, I got news for you. Jesus didn't come and live a perfect life, a sinless life, die on the cross and rise again so that you could have a list of rules to live by. He, he, didn't, he didn't come and die on the cross and rise again so you could make a religion out of it. He came because he said, I want to have a relationship with you. And I want you to be my brother and sister as we are all children of our Heavenly Father. He didn't come for religion. He came to build a family. But then we get in this slave mentality and go, okay, thanks for the invite, but I think I can do it with the rules instead. And that's why Paul's writing this whole book, like, stop it. Stop it. Jesus, I've, I've read this verse in this series already, but Jesus is talking to some, some Jewish people that are trying to follow the rules and follow the rules and follow the rules, and Jesus stops them. He says this in, in the book of John chapter 5. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you will possess eternal life. You're, you're, you're making a religion out of this whole thing. You got all the rules, you got all this work kind of going on. He said, but these scriptures that testify, they, they testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He said, you're trying to get life in what you do and don't do and can do and can't do. Instead, why don't you just come to me? Talk to me. Have a relationship with me and we'll figure out the rest as we go. Isn't that good news? He didn't, he didn't come just so we could have a system of rules and make sure we go on this day and that time and read this much and pray that much. And He goes, well, you just know me and I want to know you. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. And the third thing is this. Give God my whole heart, the whole thing. When it comes to faith in God, you can't go halfway. There's no such thing as a 50-50 faith. 50% with me, 50% with him, and we'll see which one wins in the end. There's no such thing as 51% faith. It's 100 or nothing, right? It's like, it's like saying stuff is 99% pure. Then it's not pure, right? Like, Because it's 1% impure, which makes it impure. Someone came after, after church. He goes, my wife came home with 75% organic mac and cheese. I'm like, um. He's like, yeah, exactly. He's like, then it's not organic, right? Because if it's, okay, anyway. When it comes to your faith in God, it's all or nothing, in or out, 100% or zero. It takes all your heart. And some of us have been struggling through this this journey of faith and we're, we're, we're trying to get close to God but we don't quite know how. Could it be that there's just a piece of you that you've been holding back from him that you need to just let go and jump in with both feet? The book of Jeremiah says this in chapter 29. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Not part of your heart, not in your free time, not, not when you have a second. All your heart, I will be found by you. It's a promise. It's not a you could probably find me on the right day. It's I'm here. I've been here. I've been waiting for your whole heart to be in this thing. And this morning, that's what I'm praying over you. That your whole heart would jump in to become a child of God. So you could have a relationship with that incredible heavenly father who invites you to be co-heirs with his son, Jesus, that, that puts you on the team and puts you into action and helps you live that greater life. That's my prayer for you today. So if you could with me, I know everyone walks into this room in a different kind of spiritual condition, different spiritual history, but I'd like to take a moment to pray. Can you guys do that with me? If it helps you to focus, maybe you can close your eyes and bow your heads, but I would ask, no one moving around, no noises, just want you to have kind of a distraction-free environment where you can just listen 
for the voice of God. Now, some of us in this room, we see ourselves as a son or a daughter, but we've also had some of that slave mentality creep back in. Maybe there's some have to instead of get to. Maybe there's some duty instead of devotion. Maybe, maybe God looks like a master instead of a father. It just kind of went downhill for a little while. And today your prayer, your conversation with God is, God, where is that happening and how can we get out of this? Or maybe you're here today and you've heard about God as a father and that's something you would really like. But you've never actually taken that next step to say, God, I'm all in. 100% yours. If that's you today, can I tell you it's the best decision you will ever make is to go 100% in with your heart into a relationship with God. Because he never came for you to follow a list of rules or say I'm a part of this religion or that. He came to know you and to be known by you. If you're here today and you've said, I've never done that, in a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer that says, God, I'm all in, I'm all yours. I want this relationship with you. If you want to start that relationship today, pray it right where you are. Your heart to his. So quietly, where you are, you can say some, a prayer like this. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your work on the cross that brought forgiveness into my life. And today I pray that you would make me new. I receive your grace. And today, God, I want to see you as a father, a true father. Because I know that that's going to change everything. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Everybody says, amen. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If you prayed that prayer with us, we would like to help you on your spiritual journey. If you don't mind going to theshorechurch.com or emailing us at hello at theshorechurch.com, we can send you some information to start this spiritual journey of faith. And of course, we'd always love to see you in person at The Shore Church, 3375 Fruitville Road.